and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Raluca Sgircha. I am a chess player and coach from Romania. I have decided to start my channel with a series dedicated to women in which we are going to look at some of the strongest and most important ladies in the history of chess. Uh, the first player that I uh, have decided on is Vera Menchik. She was the first women world champion. So in this episode we are going to look at one of her games. So let's go, let's see. This first game that we are going to see today is played against Monakov, uh, exactly in one of the World Championships in 1939 in Buenos Aires. Here Vera is black and she plays the King's Indian. So here G6, white plays the Fianchetto, Bishop G2, castle, E4, D6, and here white goes for the move knight e2 and black plays bishop g4. Now this move is not so common but has a very interesting idea. Uh, the move bishop g4 is aimed against the knight on e2 and the point is to play uh, for the square d4. So for example, let's say that here white uh, goes for h3 questioning this bishop on g4. Then the point is to take on e2 and here after queen e2 Black wants to play knight c6. So you see that here, black is already fighting for the center. The pawn on d4 is hanging. And, well, if um, white pushes d5, then knight d4 is coming. No, So here, black has a great knight installed on d4 already. Um, but let's say, after knight c6, white goes bishop e3. No? This makes more sense. After bishop e3, black can already play uh, e5, and again, fight for the control of the square d4. In case of d5 here, knight d4 can also come. So this is the idea of bishop g4, but bishop g4 also leaves this pawn on b7 kind of hanging, right? So this is what white does here. She plays e5, opening the diagonal of the bishop on g2 and hitting on b7. Now after e5, seems that black is losing material because she has to move the knight, and then bishop b7 is happening. But this is actually the idea that uh, our hero today had in this game. Uh, sacrifice that exchange on a8 in return for the light square bishop. She plays knight d7 here. And in the game, white couldn't resist the temptation of winning material, and she went for uh, bishop a8. This move is already a mistake, and we will see why in the game. The point will be that the king will be slightly weakened here, more than slightly actually, it will be quite weakened, and that's how black ends up winning this game. But let's say that white is not so greedy, she can play f3 instead, because it seems that the bishop on g4 is kind of um, trapped, kind of out of squares, no? Uh, here we can play rook b8, we save the rook, so if pawn takes g4, we are going to take this bishop on b7. Let's say that the bishop retreats to c6. And here we have a very beautiful line. I'm going to show you this just for fun. Bishop h3. Aiming at keeping this king in the center. We don't want to allow uh, white to castle yet. But, of course, white can play knight f4. And we have to move the bishop again. Bishop f5. And now it seems that if white goes g4, our bishop is trapped. We don't have bishop e6, because after bishop e6, then uh, d5 happens. And here we really are out of squares. But after g4, we can go for d takes e5. This move attacks the knight. So if white takes on f5, we are going to uh, get our piece back. d takes e5. And here the idea is to take back with the knight. Knight takes e5, attacks the bishop on c6. So here, for example, if white would take on f5, we would already uh, get our piece back after knight takes c6. What can white do? Well, white can take on d8, for example. Take on d8, and here bishop e8. No? Makes sense to trade the bishop and then get the bishop on f5. But here again, we of course have a move that saves the day, not only saves the day, but wins the game. If you want to try and find it, post the video. 
the very nice move that black has here is the in-between bishop c2. A great move. The threat is to go rook d1. Here we would win the rook on h1. So if white saves the bishop, then we would get the rook. And, well, if white uh, decides to play something like knight c3, for example, to um, defend d1, then we can already take the bishop and we have a big advantage, big development advantage, but also great pieces. We are going to win another pawn next because f3 is hanging and c4 is also hanging. The king is still in the center and black has a big advantage. This is a very nice line that could have happened, but let's see what happens after bishop a8 because in the end this is an exchange. So queen takes a8, we are already attacking the rook on h1 and the point in this position is that white cannot castle. It would be great if white could just castle and get the king into safety, but one of her problems will be that the king has to stay in the center. Why not castle? Because if white castles, then we have the move bishop h3. And you already see why the, um, the fact that the bishop is not on g2 is so important. The king is now uh, open and we are threatening to mate on g2 here. Queen g2 is the main threat. Of course, the rook is also hanging, so we are getting material back um, with an advantage. Let's say f3 to cut the queen, but then just take on f1 and now there is another pawn hanging on e5 that we can already take. Again, pawn takes, let's say, knight takes. Black white's position is um, weakened, the pawn on f3 is hanging, and our pieces are much better. This knight is not very happy here on e8, but uh, it will come back into the game. Knight d6 is probably coming next. So this means that after queen takes a8, if white wants to um, justify the, the move bishop a8, she needs to keep the material no? and play rook g1. But as I said before, this move um, keeps the king in the center. It's not really something we want in the beginning of the game. Now d takes e5, get this pawn. And if white takes on e5, then she is very close to losing because this knight gets in the game. Knight f3 is a big threat. Uh, we want to get the rook on g1 already. Um, more than that, it's really very close to, to mating white. For example, king f1, getting out of knight f3, falls into bishop h3. And now this, this really leads to mate. King e1, knight f3 is game over. So you see how important the weakness of the light squares is in this position. Now here, black pieces get very, very active. So the only way for white to keep fighting here is to close the diagonal of the queen, close the long diagonal and play d5. Then the knight stays passive on d7 and the queen is not active anymore. So what do we have to do here with black? First of all, in order to um, finish the attack, in order to have a strength in the attack, we need pieces. So here she plays knight to d6. She starts regrouping. Knight d6 comes with tempo. This is very important because she doesn't waste any time. White now needs to defend the pawn on c4 if she doesn't want to give up more material. But also activates the pieces, right? So here white has two options, let's say, um, if she wants to develop the pieces at the same time. In the game, she played knight a3, but this move looks a bit awkward because the knight is on the rim. Um, it does defend c4. But let's look at as well at knight d2, which seems um, more central. The problem with knight d2 is that black can keep, um, keep pressing here. She could, for example, try and open the pieces with the move c6. And knight d2 has developed the knight, but the bishop on c1 is still very passive. Also, still a very difficult position. We open the queen. Then again, ideas against uh, the square f3. This knight will come to c5, probably. The square f3 here, knight f5, knight d4 can be an idea. So um, this is again a lot of compensation for black. 
What if knight f3, knight a3, sorry, knight a3 defends the pawn on c4? So what are we going to do in this position? After knight a3, the queen on d1 and the bishop on c1 stay open. So white can continue developing. This is the point of developing the knight on a slightly um, worse square. So here, e4. This is another very strong move. First of all, because it opens the bishop on g7. This is a very important piece in the king's indian and now uh, it will it is ready to become a monster basically um, it controls the whole diagonal but the move e4 also um, eyes the weaknesses yes we have two great weaknesses here f3 and d3 that we would like to use in the near future so the move e4 also prepares knight to e5 knight f3 and knight d3 will both be threats depends a lot on how uh, white plays this h3 was played in the game offering the pawn but the idea is that if we take the pawn then our bishop gets trapped after g4 so here black goes bishop f3 we don't need that pawn we just want to keep the pieces active queen c2 and knight e5 this was our plan right g4 and here black has uh, many good moves for example the normal looking move knight d3 this is why we came all the way to e5 to play knight d3 is possible and we will keep uh, a great advantage we could go for a plan like f5 here now oh, this looks very tempting to open the rook as well but i like very much the way uh, black chose to play here because the biggest piece, the biggest problem in black's position is actually the queen on a8. We would really love to have this queen in, in the attack, to include her, but the queen is stuck on a8 and it doesn't seem that we can easily open uh, the center and include the queen. So here she finds a way to do that. She plays queen d8. A very interesting move, which does make a lot of sense, because with her last move, g4, White has also weakened uh, the dark squares. So h4 is now one of the targets. And the idea of queen d8 is to go for e6. And then here comes the queen, right? And the queen, with the queen on h4, the attack would be much stronger. We attack the pawn on h3. But we are also looking at this pawn on f2. So when we open the rook, that will come with much more strength. King f1 was played in the game and e6 that's why we played queen d8 it's very difficult to find a defense here for white she played rook g3 trying to make some way uh, for the king maybe to to run away with king g1 um, maybe knight d4 is also an idea here and maybe eliminate that bishop from f3 because if she takes on e6 instead of rook g3 would be I think this move would be just suicidal because pawn takes e6 opens the rook on f8 for free and now queen h4 is just terrible queen h4 maybe knight to d3 this should be over very soon so here white wants to keep the position as close as possible she plays rook g3 and I like again Vera's decision here because we do want to play f5. Now queen h4 doesn't come with tempo anymore. That's uh, another point of rook h3. She, uh, she defends rook g3, sorry, she defends the pawn on h3. Um, but we could play for f5. This was one of our other ideas to open the rook. But if we go f5, white could get some kind of counterplay. For example, c5, force our knight onto a much worse square, uh, something like knight c8. And now maybe knight f4. And I'm not saying that white is better here. She's not better. But uh, it does look like the pieces are starting to come out. No? From the position that we, we had before. This is already uh, maybe more difficult for us to play. So what does black do here? Instead of playing f5, she first goes for bishop e2. This uh, knight was the problem. The piece that could become active and... 
pose some problems. So she goes bishop e2, eliminate the knight, and only then pawn takes d5. This is aimed against the idea of c5 that we were seeing before. Now white has to take, and we can play f5 with um, big pressure. Bishop f4, and takes on g4. Now we open the rook finally, the bishop on f4 is hanging, she has to play bishop e5, take back, the rook is under attack, she has to take on g4 with the rook, and now it's time to start attacking the weaknesses. Our pieces are all open, they are all active, and the big weakness that white has in this position is the pawn on f2. The first move, bishop d4, rook takes f2 is going to be a huge threat. So what can white do here? There are two ways to defend. The most obvious one is rook g2, but then if rook g2 we can finally play queen h4. So now we attack f2, but we also attack h3. Both weaknesses. White won't be able to defend uh, everything for long. I think e3 is also a, an idea here. So in the game, white goes for f4, just push the pawn, but this move uh, leaves other weaknesses. We can take on f3, but I think she just didn't want to uh, allow any queen e6, yes, queen e6 check followed by rook takes d4, here we are losing uh, our good bishop on d4, there is no need for this. So knight f5 was played. The move f4 leaves another weakness um, behind, the square e3. So here knight e3 is the threat that white really can't um, defend that easily. If the rook moves from g4 again we are going to go for queen h4 as we uh, were seeing before. Now this is going to happen. White goes queen d2 here and here the queen takes d5. We could have gone for knight e3, this is also winning, but my guess is that here um, black just wanted to keep uh, the active pieces and keep the pressure, keep the initiative, instead of just um, getting the material back, because in the end white will eventually lose material here, it's impossible to keep everything together. King e2, get out of the double check, and here c5. She's consolidating, yeah? The square d4 is very important. Rook g5, and now queen e6, getting out of both pins. The pin on the d file, the pin on the fifth rank. Regroup. Knight c2, and this move allows now queen c4. So she gets the, the queen into a better position. King d1, and rook d8. Threatening to win the queen after bishop f6. The queen will be pinned. White doesn't have many options here because if king c1, this is a very nice idea here, king c1 runs into another pin, the pin over the knight on c2. So after bishop e3, we are going to win the queen again. Very nice idea here. <coughs> So she goes for king e1, yes, get out of the d-file, the only way to do so, and here finally bishop f6, and get the material back, and after queen e2, simply trade and get into a better endgame. Um, but still here she has to play carefully, and she went for knight d4, very good move in my opinion, which forces white to take and create this powerful center, powerful passed pawns um, for black. Rook d1, and here we are now in an endgame, we have to uh, bring the king, king f7, white goes b3, and the king goes all the way to the center. White stays passive with rook d2 and king f5. The weaknesses are here. So, the first thing to do is try to win them. h4, now king g4, attack h4, and white goes 
rook d1. Now we could take on h4, but what black is trying to avoid here is rook h1. Rook h1 now takes on h7, and I think here we must still be very much winning. Still very strong center, another passed pawn, but my guess is that she didn't want to allow this kind of counterplay. She wanted to keep um, everything together, so instead of just taking on h4, she plays rook d7. She has time to take on h4 later, or if she won't take on h4, then she will advance the pawns. So this will be winning anyway, no need to hurry. Yeah? Rook h1, defends, and now rook c7. White allows rook c2 maybe now. King d2, okay. Change of plans, king f4, and go for the central push. Check, king d5. Rook f8, okay, the, ro the rook looks active on f8, but um, there are no targets, everything is defended on the 7th rank, so here, just push the pawns. e3, king d1 was played in the game, let's see a, uh, king d3, this move seems to keep the pawns uh, blocked, but it really doesn't help, because here we have the move rook c3, force the king to e2, another check, and it will be impossible for white to keep the pawns in place because if king d3 we have this other check and now the pawn runs e2 followed by e1 so king d3 is also losing king d1 is of course also losing is slightly more passive and allows king d4 king d3 and h5 really doesn't uh, help in any way, we don't have to take, we don't have to actually move the pawns on the king side, but uh, black finds a very elegant way to win, in my opinion, e2. The point is that if white takes, rook takes e2, she has this very nice move, rook c1, and now she simplifies into a winning pawn endgame. Just push the pawn all the way to d1 and promote. So after e2, the game continued with king e1, but of course now rook c1 is the idea. King f2, rook f1, and finally we get to promote the e-pawn. Here is where the game ended, white resigned, and it was game over. Very nice game from Vera Menchik, we saw some very interesting uh, ideas, we saw why uh, this bishop on g2 is such an important piece in these Bianchetto structures and how she used all the weaknesses to uh, attack the king and slowly uh, win the game. Now I'm going to leave you with two positions from Vera Menchik's games to solve. Uh, first position is this one, played in another world uh, championship by Vera Menchik. Here it's black to play and win. Please pause the video, think about this for a few minutes and leave the solution in the comments. I will be checking them and see what you came up with here. And the other game that I have for you is this one. Here again it's black to play, Vera Menchik with the black pieces. She found a very strong continuation here to win material. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you've, you've enjoyed the game that we've seen today. Don't forget to pause the video and think about these little tactics that I've left you and please do share your solutions in the comments section. Thank you very much, I'll see you for the next episode.